Good evening. This is Professor Rush once again, and this time in part two of this series, I will discuss the nature of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and how they appeal to our animal nature. It is important to keep in mind that heaven is not a democracy. But it is a fact that the United States is a melting pot of people with diverse philosophies of cause and effect. Traditions stemming from Europe, however, promote individualism, while those coming from the Middle East and the Far East promote subservience to a ruler where individual rights and freedom of expression are limited or non-existent. The United States likes to promote democracy and individual freedoms, especially in areas of the world where individual freedoms are about as foreign as they could possibly be. The point is this. These two traditions are incompatible, that is, living in a world that denies freedom of expression, individualism, and personal accomplishments, that is, the Middle East, and the philosophy of individualism and personal responsibility stemming from the Greeks, Celts, and Germanic tribes. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are Middle Eastern traditions that promote slavery to a ruler and God. There's no democracy within these traditions, only pain and suffering when they enter the politic. So take your choice. Do you want to live in a system that promotes individual freedom of expression, free speech, and individual accomplishments, or a system where you are told what to do, when, and for how long? So what exactly are the traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? For they surely are not based on democratic principles. In order to understand these traditions, I need to define religion, considered by many to be a difficult task at best. Some sociologists and anthropologists have checklists as a means of defining the term. The checklist method becomes meaningless because it can include so many aspects of day-to-day -day living. For example, and as mentioned in a previous presentation, because we have In God We Trust on U.S. currency, does that make money a religion? Some people indeed worship money, checking their bank accounts each day and praying the stock market will be good to them. Recall the group in Detroit some months back who went into the church for a special service to ask God to save the car industry. This is insanity at its best. And then there are the weekend warriors who idolize and worship their favorite ball players, knowing them all by name as if reciting prayers to the gods in ancient Egypt. Then we have the religion of global warming, with the priests of this tradition, like Al Gore, accusing all of sin, the sin of destroying the planet, with redemption coming with carbon credits and watching the inconvenient truth. All these activities neatly fit into the constructed checklist of the learned sociologists and anthropologists. The way religion has been defined in recent years is, however, so general as to be useless for any meaningful discussion of the subject. So I will come to the rescue here. Now the sociologists and many anthropologists don't like my definition because it removes much of what has been thought of as religion from consideration. Religion and one's reference to that energy that informs all can only be a personal matter, even if one belongs to a group with similar prayers and reference points. The term religion is best understood and defined at the individual level or one person's piety toward some supernatural agency. This has nothing to do with what you wear, eat, drink, who you hang out with, who you hate, who you vote for, or demands placed on textbook publishers to mention intelligent design in high school textbooks, or politicking to stop abortions, and so on. Religion is best understood as a spiritual experience, an experience not given to one by a priest, or the structure of the church one visits. Spiritual experiences belong to the individual and emanate from his or her personal experience with that energy that informs all. The U.S. government avoids this definition because they would have to give tax breaks and special privileges to all members of society. And of course, politicians would lose many votes. Thus, the government and politicians who write the laws only recognize established traditions. For example, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These, however, are not religions and never have been. They are political systems that ignore the right of the individual to have his or her personal relationship with a deity or deities and decide what they should think, what they should read, 
how and when they should pray, what to eat or drink, when to have sex, what to wear, who to hang out with, who to marry, who to vote for, and so on. These traditions need to be discredited and presented to the world for what they are, fascist political systems. Moreover, most people go to mosque, temple, and church and ask the deity to pay attention to their animal nature. Most pray for health or clinging to life, children or their immortality, and wealth, status, or importance in the group. But cats and dogs likewise cling to life have sex and eat to maintain that life, and want recognition in their respective groups. There isn't one molecule of spirituality in this. The priests, rabbis, and imams encourage this attention to our animal nature because this is where the money is. They demand, through instilling fear of celestial assault, that people maintain irrational beliefs that some deity will answer their prayers and pay attention to their animal within. Not only is this fraud pure and simple, it promotes psychosis, but it goes way beyond this. Not only do these traditions promote psychosis and have us pay attention to our animal nature, they also divide people. For you're either a member of a particular tradition, or you're the enemy or someone to convert. It is the duty of every fundamental Christian and Muslim to convert everyone he or she contacts. In Islam, if a person won't convert, he or she can be killed, or worse. Read the Quran, it's all in print. Moreover, the deities of all three traditions are demons who allow killing and martyring oneself in their name. This is pretty sick and twisted stuff, as evidenced by homicide bombers in the Islamic tradition. Further, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the deity comes first and humanity comes second resulting in slavery of body and mind. It is important to understand that going to church and praying to God to pay attention to your animal nature does not promote human decency. It promotes insanity. Some of the most insane people on the planet are imams, ministers, and Catholic priests, with the Pope at the top of the list. Remember that it is the imams who recruit young men to kill infidels in the name of Allah. Just listen to the rantings of someone like Jeremiah Wright to get a flavor of this. If it wasn't for these traditions and the environments provided to direct their insanity, priests, ministers, and imams would all reside on psychiatric wards or in jail. The choice is up to you. Keep going to church and believing in gods and demons and maintain your insanity, or become a decent person through your own initiative. Our mythic hero Jesus said you don't need a priest or church. Human decency comes through knowledge, knowing thyself, personal responsibility, and individual effort. So let's get to Jesus. The original sentiments associated with Jesus have nothing whatsoever to do with slavery, violence, killing in his name, suppression of women's rights, maintaining priests or church. None of that. Jesus, of all the mythic heroes, was on a different path, one perverted by the Catholic Church for purely political and economic purposes. Jesus was an experience promoted by various what one might call gurus heading various cults that evolved out of the chaos and despair ever present 2,000 years ago in an area of the Middle East known today as Palestine. As outlined in the Mushroom and Christian Art, these cults went by many names, Jesus cults, Christ cults, Gnostics, and so on. There was not just one group that grew and grew as Jesus gained converts, a fairy tale promoted by Christian clerics. Membership in these groups was limited to perhaps 40 or 50 individuals. Not everyone was admitted. There was a test. The test was the ability to understand a parable and report back its meaning. If the recruit could answer the parable, the riddle, then he or she was eligible to commune with Jesus. Jesus was not a living, breathing human being. Jesus was an experience gained through the consumption of the holy mushroom, one of many mind-altering substances available to the various group leaders. Who or what Jesus was was revealed by John Allegro in 1970 in his book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. What Allegro found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was the identity of Jesus, the teacher of righteousness the reference, really, to the 
Hanamina muscaria mushroom, the holy mushroom, used in Judaism and numerous traditions for thousands and thousands of years to commune with the spirit world. Allegro, it needs to be known, was crucified by the Catholic Church and others for making public the real identity of Jesus. One can understand why the Church did what it did. Allegro revealed to the world the deception and fraud perpetrated by the Catholic Church since 312 of the current era. Allegro's revelation, had it become common knowledge, would have toppled Christianity, as well as all the vested interests that politicians and others had in maintaining this mythic storyline of a magical person who did magical things. Moreover, with this revelation, both Judaism and Islam would collapse as well. You can understand how revealing the basic nature of these traditions, that is, the use of mind-altering substances to commune with gods and demons, would destroy the credibility of these traditions. In part three of this series, I will reveal how Jesus was converted from an experience for those seeking knowledge, understanding self, personal responsibility, and human decency to the perversion known today as Christianity.